What's up guys and welcome back to my channel. Today on FGR News, Froggy is lost. Um, some of you might know, but for Christmas, my little sister made me this stuffed animal. Um, his name is Froggy. It's like a frog, but it looks like a, like a middle-aged man that's done with life. It's my spirit animal. It's my best friend. And I just checked my luggage and one of my bags got lost in Portugal like at the airport and I think Froggy is there which is quite daunting honestly I mean maybe he's having the time of his life in Portugal um and he's just traveling along around you know um and then he'll be back and he'll bring me some pasteles de nata like these pastels that they make uh, or sweets that they make in Portugal I don't know I don't know but I just checked I don't think he is with me I'm gonna check later again because I need to unpack as well but that was really sad. I was going to put Froggy like maybe up here or something somewhere. He's going to be a part of this setup for sure because he is a mood. Um, but either way, today we're watching a video titled Without Order Orders, the World Would Be on Fire. Mm, okay. Let's see what this video is about. <laughs> this video was sponsored by my need for validation. Okay, Life is just a never-ending game of Jenga, where all you're trying to do is build something worth the effort without it all crashing down and scratching your mother's coffee table. And the thing with Jenga is, every block's important, but some blocks are just an instant game over. Nature's kind of the same way. Every animal, from mosquitoes to monkeys, from pigeons to platypuses, everything with a heartbeat has some type of role in this giant ball of dirt and water. But where losing some animals might be bad for the environment, losing certain animals could be GG's for the whole thing. The worst part is, we usually don't know which block is a trip block until someone plays God and pulls it. Like with the sea otter. Okay, disclaimer, I don't think I've ever been more conflicted about an animal. Like, I'm smart enough to know these water wolverines are wild animals that'll play gotcha nose with their teeth, and that'll have you looking like you could unlock Voldemort's phone. But I'm also dumb enough to let them. Just cause they're cute. Otters are so freaking cute, and the way they float on the water with their backs, and then they have their little hands, like, here, it's so... Oh, it's adorable. It's so cute. Look at the white teeth, the little small teeth. It's so cute. I want to punch it in the face. I'm aware they have one of the most violent mating rituals I've ever read about, but they also hold hands while sleeping and they wrap their babies in cup blankets so they don't float away. One thing I will say is that without these water weasels, the ocean would almost certainly be in a pack. And it's all because sea otters need a borderline eating disorder just to survive. These guys are all marine mammals, but one is not like the others. Sea otters don't have blubber or a layer of fat to keep them warm. When you live in the ocean full time, that's living life on veteran difficulty. Which is why sea otters can put away 25% of their body weight in food every single day. All just to fuel their metabolism and not freeze from otter to article. 25% in food would be like me downing 95 Big Macs. I know this because I did the math, don't ask me if I have a problem, I probably do. These furry food vacuums have a grocery list of basically anything that isn't nailed down, but the most important thing they eat are sea urchins. A motivated male can put away up to 50 sea urchins in a 24 hour binge. Which is what makes this high sea honey badger one of those do not touch Jenga blocks. Cause sea urchins are vicious vegans that eat kelp like they get paid for it. Kelp forests provide food as well as shelter and a nursery for several species of animals. Not only that, but this water cactus will literally spawn camp. They'll go into this weird hibernation on top of a kelp bed but only reanimate to eat any seaweed that sprouts up. How, how do they eat that though? Don't, isn't that like, you know, doesn't that pinch you? Without otters to keep the sea urchins in check, a bunch of animals would basically become homeless, if not starve to past tense completely. Pretty much jenga this entire community. And it literally took nearly hunting this live-action plush toy into extinction before he realized this. I showed this picture before for a reason. In places where sea otters were stab padded into oblivion and the sea urchins started wilding out, what used to be kelp forests quickly became underwater deserts. Basically diversity dead spots. Instead of a PWI, this dead spot represents the loss of an ecosystem that actually helps us more than most people realize. Add the fact that kelp forests help fight climate change, you begin to realize just how wild the butterfly effect really is. Some guy liked the way a certain coat fell, next thing you know, global warming's up 3-1 on it. Oh my goodness, just look at it, just scratch it, his little cheeks, that's so cute. <laughs> the butterfly effect really is. Some guy liked the way a certain coat fell, next thing you know, global warming's up 3-1 on us. Sea otters aren't the only ones with that kind of power. This is a wolf eel. It's not a wolf, it's not an eel, it's a fish fresh out of Tim Burton's wet dream. If you've never heard of it before, it's because pretty privilege is painfully real. But I will say this, Nemo's paralysis demon has a relationship many people wish they had. Wolffish mate for life, and when a male and female do pair up, they'll find a cave and basically move in together. That's kind of cute. Honestly, I don't know why, but they kind of look a little bit cute. 
hear me out like you know the big eyes and they're good they're like so ugly that they're cute because it's like oh like nobody wants to see that and that makes me feel bad and then i think it's really cute i mean the teeth outside like in the in the photo below is a little bit disturbing but you know i don't know i don't know do you guys see what i'm saying <laughs> And when they have kids, they'll take turns getting groceries, with one staying behind to guard the eggs while the other one eats. The one that does stay behind will gently massage the eggs and turn them over to make sure they receive enough oxygen and proper circulation. At worst, it's healthy co-parenting, and at best, it's a marriage worth slapping a comedian over. It's a marriage where everyone eats. But speaking of eating, that's actually what makes this fish another important block in the ocean's Jenga tower, since they'll use that demonic overbite to eat animals like the sea urchin. And the Atlantic wolfish in particular eats enough sea urchins to where if you Thanos snap them, a lot of animals will be down bad too. But they don't get the credit ought to do because, well, who would you rather turn into a stuffed animal? That's why sea otters and the Atlantic wolfish are both considered keystone species. Keystone basically means that in the Jenga Tower of Life, taking out the keystone or block would turn the entire tower into ground zero. And I would love to pretend the whole Jenga analogy was a play on the word keystone, but uh, nah, I didn't realize that till halfway through writing this. Sometimes I'm not clever, I'm just lucky. Obviously, if you delete an entire species, there's always going to be some kind of net negative. But with a keystone like the otter, it would be a thousand times worse. Like, even though they're both important, missing Michael Jordan for an entire playoffs is going to hit a little different than losing Luke Longley. And as a Heat fan, not having Mario Chalmers for a finals game might cost me an hour of sleep. Take out LeBron and suddenly I'm an insomniac. There's a bunch of different types of keystone species, but one of the most famous and the one you likely learned about first are probably beavers. Since beavers shape their entire communities just by being themselves. I was just wondering what, like, otters and beavers are. I, is that not the same thing? It's not, no. They're bucktooth engineers that'll build dams to create ponds. In the middle of these ponds are lodges, and that is the beaver's home address. Having waterside real estate makes it less likely for them to get turned into a happy meal by bears, wolves, cougars, coyotes, owls, lynxes, bobcats. You bears. see why they need the bears. lodge. Without it, they're the lollipop of the north. They take licks from everybody. But it also means in some places, beavers are single-handedly responsible for creating wetlands, making the beaver yet another key block on the Jenga tower. Beaver dams and the wetlands they create lead to more herbaceous plants growing by the water. They also help clean out pollution from rivers and streams. And about half of the endangered species in North America depend on the wetlands the beavers help engineer. Basically take out this plus size water gerbil and you're sentencing several animals to the gulag too. It's so cute. Also, if you play the sound of running water on a speaker, beavers will instinctively start building a dam over it. That has nothing to do with anything, I just find that fact fun. But unlike beavers, most keystone species are usually predators and that concept's pretty simple. Without an equalizer to eat the prey, the prey would ironically eat themselves and everything around them to death. Which is why tiger sharks also earn a keystone title. Here are some things that have been found inside a tiger shark. License plates, rubber boots, a bag of money, a chicken coop, a full suit of armor, and a human leg. One thing about sharks, they're not racist, they don't see color, and they do not discriminate. And just like with otters and sea urchins, tiger sharks are population control for a bunch of animals, like sea turtles, especially the ones that like to graze on seagrass. Seagrass, that's an important habitat and shelter for fish and shellfish. It's an easy domino effect. You no know, tiger sharks means more sea turtles, means less seagrass, means more fish and shellfish on the streets. Or in this case, reefs. Which is why most sharks are considered keystones in the ocean community. For example, when most of the great white sharks in the North Atlantic got packed up, that led to the number of cow nose rays exploding. Those rays proceeded to decimate nearly the entire population of scallops, clams, and oysters. Shark That's crazy. Sharks are the ultimate equalizer. Take them out and that tower gets less stable than the marriage of a comedian slapping back in the 90s rapping Air to Bel Air. Yeah, that's, that's probably strike two. But oftentimes, it takes a tower toppling over to realize just how important that block was. The best example is when we literally had to mess around and find out in Yellowstone. If you haven't heard this story, you about to hear some sh**. Once upon a time, the cousin of man's best friend was public enemy number one and wolves got put on a list. And the reason why? Well, if wolves didn't hate us before, they had a really good reason to now. Basically, in the before time, settlers came on the scene with their livestock, mostly cattle. As the practice of agriculture grew, animals on the wolves' grocery list like buffalo started disappearing from the aisles. All it took were a few going after livestock for America to declare a war on wolves. Any wolf that was spotted within the same area code as livestock was immediately taken off the census with brutal prejudice. At one point, even the US Army showed up and got their shots up. And to add insult to massacre, in 1883 there was a law passed that prohibited hunting of most animals in the park. And wouldn't you know, wolves were not most animals. They even tried to justify it by calling wolves an undesired predator and implied that the environment would be better off without them. Basically, America gaslit wolves. 
It's like if you broke into my house, replaced most of the food in my refrigerator, and then turned me and my family into chalk outlines for touching the ground beef you left in my freezer. Now, guys and gals, on a scale from Reddit incel to Tiana Trump, how screwed do you think we were after we basically squad wiped wolves? The answer? We got casting couched. Without wolves applying top-down pressure, the elk population got out of pocket and they ate the area code. Cause even with cougars, coyotes, and even bears, the main thing keeping the elk down got put on a newspaper by us and as a result it stripped the land of vegetation. But it actually went deeper than that. Without the threat of wolves keeping the elk on the move, the elk were able to stay in one place and eat that place completely clean. Animals that relied on wolf leftovers like ravens, magpies, and even bears had to get their protein elsewhere. And if that wasn't bad enough, one of the things that the elk destroyed was the willow. The same willow that damn building beavers needed to survive the winter. The same beavers were no. responsible for creating wetlands, which meant yet another Jenga block that hit the hardwood. I like to imagine the wolves that got murked on sight watch this all go down from the afterlife like, yeah, ain't that a bit? It got to the point where we had to airdrop wolves back to Yellowstone to try to uno reverse the damage. And by the time we did that, there was only one colony of beavers left. Today, there's about 100 wolves left in Yellowstone after we did everything in our power to abolish them. That's crazy. See, humans should just, like, let it be. If you, if you, if there's too many wolves, you go somewhere else. Let them be. Because <laughs> removing a keystone species is like leaving a toxic relationship. But then your life gets worse and worse until you realize you were the problem. It's honestly the butterfly effect served on Trent. And again, you never know which block's going to be the game over. For example, one of these guys was one of the first animals to be identified as a keystone species. Any idea which one? It was actually the purple sea star. This is Robert Payne. He's a zoologist who was credited with coming up with the keystone concept. He's also six foot six. Must be nice. To better understand how nature and all the things in it are connected, Payne ventured out to a bay near Washington State, where he proceeded to yeet as many starfish as he could find. For years, Payne would return to the same stretch of rock and turn any starfish into a frisbee just to see what would happen with them gone. If you identified as one, his name was ironic. What happened is that, like Spongebob's day one, sea stars eat almost anything, and the particular ones he had yeeted ate mostly mussels. It sure look freaky, don't it? With this main op out of the way, the mussels started multiplying and eventually gentrified the entire stretch of rock, to the point where they actually forced other species out. By evicting Patrick's family, the diversity of the community went from 15 species to 8 since there were no longer any starfish to keep the muscles down. And of course, sea stars- it's so interesting how everything kind of goes together. Don't do this on purpose. They have no brain, nothing they do is on purpose. But by being themselves, sea stars kept the muscles from multiplying, which gave the other species a chance. I wonder if I can get guidelined for this. The irony is, since muscles are a foundational species, having an entire bed of them created a habitat for even more species. So in the long run, it actually improved diversity. Because nature would honestly rather break its own rules than be predictable. But by sending starfish into orbit, Dr. Payne helped us understand the Jenga effect of taking out the wrong block. But animals don't have to meal prep their neighbors to be considered keystones. Some scientists actually considered sloths to be in the keystone tier. One reason is because- Of course they are, look at them. <laughs> the entire existence of multiple animals depends on this dead-eyed, blind with no glasses, slower than molasses moss carpet. Up to 80 different species of animal live rent-free in sloth fur. In fact, one sloth can have up to 800 moths- I identify with this a lot. I kind of look like him. Look at that. I kind of look like a sloth. Beetles, worms, and roaches hitching a ride in this jungle taxi. These algae trailer homes also carry fungi, and scientists now believe that the chemicals produced by this fungus can be used to fight malaria, other parasitic diseases, and even cancer. This shag carpet come to life could really be the reason we win the war on cancer. Maybe sloths aren't so weak. I did say maybe. Then you have this guy. The southern hairy-nosed wombat is a marsupial that spends most of its life in underground burrows. So much of this dirt koala's personality involves digging that they literally have a backwards pouch. That way the kids don't literally eat dirt every time the mother digs a new home. Which is also what makes this Ewok an unintentional hero. Animals often use vacant wombat burrows as shelter, especially during bushfires. And during droughts, wombats un- I, I've, I, I've heard about wombats, but I don't know if I've seen one. Intentionally save their neighbors by digging out watering holes that end up being used like not even in a video or maybe I have Bushfires and during droughts wombats unintentionally save their neighbors by digging out watering holes that end up being used by kangaroos Wallabies possums goannas and even emus wombats manage to give back to the community just by being themselves Even though they give me old man introvert energy and if there was an African shadow clone of the wombat It would definitely be the aardvark It's the same thing where aardvarks will dig out burrows that eventually get used as nurseries for hyenas wild dogs lizards and snakes animals will also use this what a cool animal. Pigs abandoned bunkers as a place to hide from the brutal African sun. 
Aardvarks are also single-handedly responsible for a type of plant, since they're usually the only ones eating it and spreading the seeds. Which is how the Aardvark cucumber got its name. And how Aardvarks might be the most underrated animal here. But the biggest keystone of them all is the elephant. No, like literally. They're the biggest. During dry seasons, they dig up riverbeds and create watering holes that other animals can drink from. They're a free uber for plant seeds and help spread them across the environment. Elephants play a role in the ecosystem simply by knocking down trees and undergrowth. And as the world's heaviest gardeners, they help clear room for different types of grass. And by straight up flexing trees right out the ground, vertically challenged animals like the impala score a free meal off the elephant's muscle. And in forests, plus size pachyderms create clearings to help sunlight reach the floor. Which gives lower lying plants a chance. Because elephants are the CEO of looking after the little guy. And when you're built like a 5 ton armored vibe check, everyone's little. And without these African architects doing them, that Jenga tower would fold on itself. Moral of the story, life's irrelevant without elephants. That's gonna do it for this video. For more consistent content, be sure to follow my Instagram and TikTok. I try to post daily on both. And if you want access to content before I post it, or you want to like buy me food or something, my Patreon is also going to be in the description in case you want to support this low quality vertically filmed content. Which is a question I often get and the answer is I film vertically for the same reason God made me 5'11 with scoliosis. It's to keep me humble. Plus if I started filming horizontally, it would really be over for everybody. 5'11? He's the same height as me? Did he just say that? Content. Which is a question I often get, and the answer is, I film vertically for the same reason God made me 5'11 with scoliosis. It's to keep me humble. Plus, if I started filming horizontally, it would really be over for everybody. I'm just trying to give these other YouTubers a chance. That's sarcasm, by the way. I wish I was that cocky. Okay, last plug and I swear we're done, but if you haven't heard, I have a book coming out July 5th that's currently available for pre-order. As well as an audiobook in case you're like me and have the attention span of a hyper-caffeinated squirrel. Aside from that, drink water, hug your mother, be sure to thank your local otter, and I'll see you in the next one. I think he's now doing them vertical. I mean horizontal. It's so cute. If I had like a house and a yard full of otters, I'd be I'd be very happy as well. I very very cute. Look at the whiskers. I love it um anyways thank you guys for joining me for this video i hope you liked it i think this was such an interesting one and a good one and it's so interesting to see how everything kind of works together in the in in the nature um and yeah once again thank you for joining me i hope you liked it please leave a like subscribe and i'll see you guys in the next one